Hi, I'm Darty Pringle. I'm the nurse at the junior school. And today we're going to talk about uh, recognizing potential mental health problems in the classroom. Um, our district strategic plan previously stated that we want our uh, students to be physically fit and have a healthy mind, body, and soul. And our more recent profile of a learner clarifies this goal by promoting the idea that a learner has to develop a healthy sense of self. So today we want to further our understanding of how we as teachers and staff can further this process. Uh, one thing I'd encourage everyone to do is look into youth mental health first aid training. Uh, this is an evidence-based program that trains you to recognize signs and symptoms of mental health crisis and to give initial help to an individual experiencing crisis or developing crisis. Um, this is uh, my interest in promoting mental health education in schools and communities um, led me to becoming a, a mental health first aid instructor. So first we want to talk about what, what a mental health disorder or mental illness is. Uh, it's a diagnosable illness that affects your thinking, emotional state, and behavior and disrupts your ability to work, uh, carry out daily activities, and engage in satisfying relationships. I'm not going to be reading off all the slides here just so you know, but they will be available to you. Mental health disorders are common. They're more common than heart disease, lung disease, and cancer combined. One in five Americans is estimated to have a diagnosable mental health disorder like anxiety, depression, or substance use uh, in any given year. Uh, of those children with diagnosable disorders, only about one out of three get help from formal mental health care or substance abuse services. So it's kind of an under, uh, underserved issue. Half of all mental illness begins before the age of 14. So it's not it is not an adult problem. It is. It happens um, most, or at least half of cases start in a school-aged child. This slide just kind of shows you if you have a, a mental health disorder, you're very likely to have a co-occurring substance use problem or other mental health issue. So the kind, the two go hand in hand. Um, we uh, understand that any substance use used by an adolescent other than that which is prescribed and used as directed by a doctor should be regarded as, as serious. Recently, uh, there's been a lot of uh, studying done, uh, studies done about uh, cyberbullying and how technology is, is becoming um, a, a large factor in developing uh, mental health issues. Um, cyberbullying affects over a third of young people today. Um, and a good percentage of those uh, who experience cyberbullying have a severe traumatic reaction to that. Um, it's been well established now that technology is increasing levels of stress in young people and, uh, and is precipitating um, mental health problems. So that's, been, that's kind of an established fact and we're just trying to adapt to that. Here are a few things that, that you can do. I know um, it's an overwhelming uh, phenomenon, but but it can be helped, and we as educators, uh, there's a lot that we can do. So here's just a, a listing of the things you can read over those. Don't be concerned that you're responsible for being for diagnosing, because that's not the job of the teacher or the counselor or even the nurse. Uh, the counselors will refer um, to healthcare providers, but only a physician or licensed mental health provider can diagnose a mental health disorder. But your job is just to kind of pay attention and see if there's any anything changing, anything of concern. As a society, we need to increase our comfort level in talking openly about mental health and mental illness in order to decrease the stigma that surrounds it, because there is definitely a stigma that surrounds mental health. So here's a few tips that you can use to assist your students. Uh, just know them as you do. Uh, notice changes in their behavior, um, trends or patterns that are happening more f frequently. Non-judgmental listening is a powerful tool, as you all know. Allow silence. Sometimes this is awkward, um, but just allowing that to take place. Patience and uh, not interrupting when somebody's trying to express themselves. And encourage that child to get help, uh, you know, from their parents, uh, from their peers, or from any resources, that, the resources available at the school. As we know, adolescence is a time of great change. Um, there's physical, social, and emotional change. And sometimes you wonder, uh, you know, if what's going on is normal or if it's not normal. And sometimes it's difficult 
to tell the difference between what's normal and what's not. So here's a way of kind of determining that. Symptoms in developing mental health challenges can be similar to normal development. Uh, an adolescent child will experience withdrawal and uh, from family to spend more time with friends, and that's a normal behavior. But if the withdrawal is more severe, more prolonged, that could be a warning sign. Uh, the same thing is privacy issues. If uh, you know the need for privacy becomes excessive and prolonged, that may be uh, concealing that that teenager may be concealing some kind of substance use or developing symptom of mental health challenge. So what you want to do is focus on the impact of the change on the young person and and the time factor. Um, notice if they're struggling with school, if they're avoiding social engagements. Uh, if they no longer enjoy the things that they used to enjoy. We're going to review some self-help strategies, risk factors, and protective factors. There are numerous self-help strategies uh, that on a daily basis we encourage young people to try. Just keep in mind they should be uh, interesting to the individual child, encourage a sense of achievement and satisfaction. They should be social and not you know, uh, individual, and they should be safe, of course. There are so many risk factors in adolescence, um, as we all know, and this, this is just a few of them. Um, recent studies have shown that it's the dopamine that you get from taking the risks that the child that uh, encourages the behavior. Um, previous studies have said it's because the brain is not as developed, and there's emerging studies that show that really what's happening is the is the dopamine response is just very attractive. Uh, an addictive type of thing. So here are protective factors that promote resilience and recovery in young people. So it's important for you to look at all the things you're doing right because we as educators are doing a lot of these things and we're doing them very well here. Uh, you're not here to, to diagnose and counsel, but you are the front line for recognizing when something may be going wrong. So use your counseling and health and wellness resources here in the district. Uh, Employing mindfulness practices has proven to help students be more resilient, and you can uh, there's there's all kinds of mindfulness resources now. It's kind of a big thing. Everyone has a story, and you don't have to know that story, but be aware that outside the classroom, your student's life may be out of control. It's very important also to take time for self-care. Teachers and caregivers are notoriously reluctant to put themselves first when it comes to their own health and well-being. And it's important to know that you will do a better job if you give yourself time to nurture your own interests and connections. So let's just review uh, depression a little bit. Uh, these are the signs and symptoms of a major depressive disorder. If you notice the first two symptoms as well are primary, and if you see those for more than two weeks, then you might think that, uh, that they're, this teenager is uh, dealing with a major depressive disorder. So here's what you might see at school. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. You can freeze these slides later to look at them. Here's what you might see in a social setting. And here are uh, risk factors for depression. We're going to move very quickly to anxiety now. We're going to talk about anxiety. Um, anxiety uh, can look like a physical problem, so it's important to determine whether that student is, in fact, experiencing a physical problem or not. If you do feel like they're having a physical problem, then you can send them uh, to the nurse. If you think it's a, a serious uh, physical problem, like a cardiac event, uh, then you can call EMS. Um, you can ask that student, have you had an anxiety attack before? Do you think this might be anxiety? It's okay to talk about that. And they may tell you, yes, I do. I have anxiety. And then you'll know what you're dealing with. Anxiety disorders are caused by a co combination of genetic, biological, psychological, and environmental factors. So they're not the result of weakness or character defect or poor upbringing. They're just they're very complicated uh, cause situations. It's important to understand that recovering from mental health disorders is not just a matter of will and self-discipline. This is what you might see at school. Anxiety is a common issue with school-age kids. There's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, there's a lot of overcompetition academically, and that can lead to stress and burnout. Anxiety isn't the same thing as anxiety disorder, but unmanaged anxiety can lead to a disorder. The same can be said for depression. Uh, it's important to communicate 
feelings in order to get help uh, to manage them. We're going to talk about uh, suicide now. This is um, some suicidal behaviors, and, and we have already received training in this, so we're, we've become familiar with that. Uh, as of June 2016, suicides have become the second leading cause of death among teenagers in the U.S., uh, surpassing homicide deaths. Um, higher suicide rates are partly because of the method of suicide. Teens who complete suicide are increasingly using lethal means like suffocation and firearms. Um, and there's a rising rate among teenage girls. Uh, the overall mortality rate for teenagers on the good news side has fallen more than 30 percent because of the declining rates of death by motor vehicle crashes and gun violence. Here are some more suicidal behaviors. Here are some things to do uh, if, if you um, encounter somebody that you feel like is, su is suicidal. You shouldn't try to debate the value of life with that person or try to, try to help them fix the problem right then and there. And you shouldn't minimize their problems. This is where the active listening comes in and the non-judgmental listening. So here are some actions to take if a student does threaten suicide. There is a big difference between a suicide cluster effect uh, which is when a group of suicides happen in a, in a school or community and asking an individual if they've contemplated self-harm or suicide. Asking a student if they've thought about harming themselves or killing themselves is not going to put the idea in their head. It is going to give them an opportunity to voice any thoughts they may be having and receive appropriate help. Uh, it's a difficult word to say, but we should avoid euphemism in talking around the issue. Uh, we should not say, are you thinking of hurting yourself, instead of, uh, I'm sorry, um, we should ask, are you thinking of hurting yourself instead of, are you thinking about doing something stupid? We should say, are you thinking of killing yourself instead of, are you thinking of ending it all? We want to be direct with them and honest with them. We don't want to scare them, but if they're already thinking about it, uh, it will be a relief for, for them to, to hear you uh, verbalize that thought. Here's some uh, numbers to know, and this is going to end our, uh, our presentation. Thank you so much for listening.